Uh, welcome everyone on the call. We hope you and yours are safe. Uh, we're grateful to you for joining us today. I think all of us seek community in these times. Social distancing is not a normal uh, behavior. I, I know all of us at the nation take heart in the solidarity and compassion we've witnessed over the last few weeks. We extend solidarity to the many who do not have the option to work remotely, uh, who face uncertain, unimaginable financial conditions, uh, future. Um, our reporting the other day about the postal workers uh, by a former intern, Jake Biddle, by the way, was cited by Senator Sanders as he called for an investigation into protections for workers against the coronavirus. So many are heroically putting their lives on the line. And we at the nation are, um, we closed our offices on the 12th. Uh, we've all been working remotely since, um, but in the belief we need a free independent press more than ever, uh, we're working hard remotely, um, putting out a digital magazine. Anna Hyatt, the executive web editor, uh, told us today we've broken records, not seen in a few years, 6.2 million page views this past month. And we're working hard because we want to report the truth and campaign for justice and bring you in-depth commentary, not just on the coronavirus, the crisis, but the state of our politics, our democracy, our world, the health of our planet. Um, because I was talking about Dave with this, about this earlier, the dangers are so real and made far worse by an administration in Washington whose general incompetence has been compounded by its hostility to science. So the need for bold solutions, something we care deeply about, and we'll continue lifting up those solutions and calling for courage, solidarity, compassion. We deeply, deeply value your support in all times, especially these. And uh, this is the first, I'm very glad to introduce Dave Zirin. This is the, we, the first of our breakfast series. We hope to have Reverend Barber with us, uh, anti-corruption activist, thinker, Zephyr Teachout, Representative Pramila Jayapal, environmental guru, Bill Mc, uh, McKibben, longtime nation contributor, Naomi Klein, Ali Mistal, others. So please keep checking your emails. Um, and many thanks to Sarah Burke, to Aaron, to Anna Hyatt, to Peter Rosberg for coordinating this first one. As Sarah said, it's an experiment of sorts, but I'm sure we'll, we'll venture forth. So to Dave Zirin, um, the nation's sports editors, editor since 2006, uh, the author of nine books and hosts the nation's Edge of Sports po po uh, podcast. And Zirin has brought his singular blend of politics and sports to so many TV programs, I'm not gonna tick them off. Amy Goodman, uh, Morning Joe, Rachel Maddow, ESPN. He's written for many newspapers. Um, and by the way, let's hope newspapers survive. We're doing a big piece, I think, on a stimulus for journalism. Um, I'm proud that I was the first nation editor to hire the magazine's first sports correspondent. It took a woman. Um, but I've always believed, I know, as you know, sports is an arena in which struggles for racial justice, economic fairness, gender equality have always played out. And Dave has always pursued sports writing in that way as it intersects with the pursuit of social and economic justice. So I'm going to turn it over to the inimitable Dave Zirin. Thank you for launching this with us, Dave. And then uh, we'll, you know, we'll hear from Dave and take questions and open it up to a conversation. So thank you so much for joining us and hope to see you next Wednesday. Thank you so much, Katrina. Welcome everybody to the wide world of sports. <laughs> Before we start, just as a framework for this conversation, let's remember that as we talk about sports, it's not just sports. It's a global athletic industrial complex worth billions of dollars with every decision having far reaching effects beyond just athletes and fans. Uh, people might have seen the news today that Wimbledon has been canceled for the first time since 1945. So the effects of what are ta what's taking place is so far reaching. And we are preparing, we are living a life without sports. And this still stuns me that this is our reality. We are in uncharted territory right now in the sports world, living without a compass. I mean, just ponder it for a moment. I mean, sports, whether you're a sports fan or not, I think people need to understand that sports is how many of us measure the passage of time. It's how we measure the seasons. I mean, football for so many people is autumn and the changing of the leaves. Basketball and hockey, that's winter. NCAA basketball, they own the month of March and there isn't a spring or a summer 
without baseball. And let me also say it's perfectly understandable why sports are woven so fiercely into the fabric of our lives. I mean, before coronavirus, nothing has ever stopped the march of our athletic industrial complex. Sports kept on going through two world wars, uh, the 1918 influenza pandemic. It was used to keep up morale and some modicum of normalcy during times of crisis. Uh, during the First World War, there was talk of shutting sports down, and Woodrow Wilson uh, came out very fiercely against doing that, saying, I hope that sports will be continued as a real contribution to the national defense. Franklin Roosevelt also contradicted the all-powerful commissioner of Major League Baseball, Judge Kennesaw Mountain Landis, during World War II, insisting that the games be played, even though many of the players, the star players, were themselves serving overseas. Uh, the, the influenza pandemic, the aforementioned influenza pandemic of 1918, which infected one third of the globe, only slowed the 1918 World Series insofar as Major League Baseball banned the spitball during that World Series out of health concerns and the risk of contagion. That's all, that was the only allowance they made for the 1918 pandemic was banning the spitball. Uh, <laughs> John F. Kennedy was assassinated on a Friday and the NFL was playing on Sunday. Hmm. Even 9-11 only delayed NFL games by one week, and that was because of a player's revolt. And yet we see with the coronavirus, with astonishing speed, it's all shut down. Coronavirus is different, of course, and not only because of the crowds. I mean, imagine instead of sports becoming a distraction from national calamity, sports teams uh, and the games could have become a traveling roadshow of disease clusters, a band of patient zeros traveling from city to city, infecting fans along the way. Uh, this is why it took Utah jazz player Rudy Gobert testing positive for the coronavirus and spreading the disease to his all-star teammate Donovan Mitchell way back in early March to wake the sports world up to the reality that it was not immune. I mean, in one day, the National Basketball Association uh, went from merely saying that players should fist bump instead of high five fans. That was their entire protocol in early March. Fist bump, don't high five fans, to shutting down the whole multi-billion dollar global operation with a snap of the fingers. Now this was the correct decision when it comes to public safety, but we have to realize that it comes with its own set of costs, like the low wage stadium and arena workers who now have no income at all. Uh, we must remember that most of these teams play in publicly funded sports cathedrals that were built with promises of job creation. Uh, it, this was, has always been, as I've written about for years, a very specious argument uh, since the sports world is often uh, offers seasonal work. Um, this idea that sports stadiums create this panacea of jobs within um, an urban environment has always been a specious argument. Uh, the one economist who I I love, he said that we'd be better off dropping a billion dollars from an airplane and letting people just pick up the money and spend it than we would be using them to build sports stadiums. But now is the time for sports team owners to make good on their assurances that stadiums would help working people and not leave them destitute. And some have done so. Some sports owners have stepped up and, and, and done so and committed to paying the salaries of the people who clean the bathrooms and serve us hot dogs at the stadiums but only because some star athletes have leveraged their fame to shame. That's what I was calling it, leveraging their fame to shame, as in shaming the billionaire class to do the right thing and support their workers through these hardships. Uh, we saw this last week when Philadelphia 76ers star center Joel Embiid pledged $500,000 for COVID-19 relief in local communities, as well as helping Sixers employees who would have been hurt. And this pushed within an hour the 76ers ownership to backtrack on their intention to cut employees pay by 20%. Uh, Joel Embiid literally stopped a pay cut for hundreds of people through using his fame to shame. We've seen other players like 19 year old Zion Williamson leverage his fame to shame by donating his own money to pay stadium workers and then force ownership to scurry and pledge to do the same. Now, outside of the world of sports, I would make the case that one would be hard pressed to find members of the billionaire class stepping up to fight this virus, where they're giving a pittance to this national calamity. But in sports, they have actually ponied up some money 
And without players pushing them to do so, it's difficult to imagine that they would have done anything except taking the opportunity to cut back. They would have followed the footsteps of Houston Rockets owner, a man named Tillman Fertitta, who, used the, who has used the coronavirus to lay off 40,000 employees uh, through his archipelago of, of restaurants and casinos. And he's using the money he's saving by laying off the employees to buy back his debt on the Houston Rockets to inflate the value of the franchise and just laying tens of thousands of people off to get that bit of economic voodoo done. Uh, we've seen members of the sports community step up in other ways as well. Um, one action, and it's the most basic and human of all, is that of transparency. Uh, we learned on Friday that ESPN basketball announcer, the beloved Doris Burke, has contracted the virus. And Burke wants to be open about what she's going through as a way to speak to others about the importance of health, safety, and social distancing. Uh, Carl Anthony Towns, who is an all-star center for the Minnesota Timberwolves, has taken to Instagram to speak about how both his parents are now suffering through the virus. His mother, Jacqueline Cruz, who I've met before, uh, is in a medically induced coma and has been put on a rest. Mm -hmm. uh, the aforementioned Rudy Gobert has been open about his symptoms and recovery. Uh, Marcus Smart of the Boston Celtics, who's a maddening player, but who I'll compliment now, perhaps for the first time, is donating plasma to see if the antibodies in his plasma can be used to create uh, immunity or a vaccine of some kind. And he wants to be intimately involved in that, pro of the va that vaccination making process. Now, I think these stories serve the mighty purpose of letting people know that anyone can contract the virus and that when we forego social distancing, the risk is very real. Another way to raise awareness was seen last Thursday and it was pulled off by a uh, Golden Warriors guard, Steph Curry. People might have seen this. He held an Instagram live chat with Dr. Anthony Fauci and actually was able to ask many of the common sense questions that never seem to be answered in Trump's daily media rallies because Trump himself takes up so much space with his blithering ignorance and, sh and, and sad showmanship. Now, Curry was able to ask questions that I think a lot of us have, like asking Fauci to compare and contrast the flu to the coronavirus, to ask about warm weather and its effects for mitigation and more. And literally hundreds of thousands of people have tuned in to watch this interview. The examples above, I hope, give folks a sense of hope about what athletes can do amid this crisis. They can raise awareness, be open with their struggles, use social media, or push their billionaire bosses to actually do something. Uh, it might not seem like much, but at a moment when helplessness and fear seem to be the dominant and guiding emotions, there's definitely a sense of hope that comes with seeing players with a conscience exercise that conscience in the most difficult of circumstances. Undoubtedly, athletes can play a role in the sports world, but I think the question lingers, and I know some folks on this call might have this question, uh, which is, when will sports actually return? Mm -hmm. uh, we've seen Major League Baseball proclaim these arbitrary dates and the NBA talk about different playoff formats and the NFL speak with confidence about the start of their season this fall. This is, I'm sorry to say, total crap. Uh, as Dr. Anthony Fauci said, we don't make the timeline, the virus makes the timeline. We have to be patient and realize that sports will return when it is not a risk to the public health. And I have to say, as someone who's argued that this relationship we have with sports in this country is at times beautiful, but is at times also an abusive and unhealthy relationship. Maybe it's actually good. Maybe it's actually a silver lining for the national psyche that we all just take a collective break. That's what I got. Thank you so much, Dave. Um, very powerful in terms of talking about the hope we can take from those players with conscience walking us through the history and what an unprecedented time we're in and how players are leveraging their fame to shame the billionaires. Um, how do you see, um, and this is a long-term question and we're grappling with long-term structural thoughts and questions at the nation. How do you think professional sports will be permanently changed by um, this crisis? Yeah, I think they will be permanently changed. First of all, in some very concrete ways. I mean, you're going to see pay cuts across the board as leagues suffer financially. Leagues are gonna be no different than other areas of business in this country. Uh, they've, they've lost billions of dollars and you're gonna see a trickle down effect in terms of salaries, in terms of free agency. 
Uh, and it's going to rip apart a lot of what the unions in sports have fought to build. And so a lot of these union agreements that have been very important to athletes over the years and very important to the labor movement as well, I think you can see a lot of those cast aside. Um, I also think this is a big unknown, and I've debated folks about this. I also think it's going to uh, do something to a generation of fan participation. I mean, an interesting little factoid is that sport, we, we worship sports in this country, yet if you look at the ages of typical fans in the different sports, they tend to be older. Uh, they tend to be um, over the age of 30, your average fan in the different sports, because young people are doing different things. I have a podcast up at The Nation right now about the rise of esports, uh, people just simulating sports on their computers and how that has exploded during this virus as people have stayed at home. And sports networks are even showing esports, like simulated computer generated sports on uh, television screens, and they're actually getting very high ratings. So you could be looking at a generation of people coming up who live through this, who don't necessarily gravitate towards sports uh, as a point of entertainment, uh, which is going to um, ail the sports world going forward. And also I have real questions about what it's gonna to do to the national psyche in terms of people's desire to gather in crowds. I mean, so much of sports is about uh, experiencing a collective space when you come together to cheer for your team. Um, and I really do wonder what's going to happen to that sense of people feeling secure in a collective space in the sports world. Because remember going to sports games, this is a voluntary and very expensive activity. Uh, it's not like going to a demonstration or a picket line where people feel this sense of, of, of being compelled to have to go out and fight for their, for their basic standards of living. So I wonder if these kinds of luxury collective events like a sporting event is going to be something that uh, is viewed as something as, as old fashioned as the spitball itself. Wow. So Sarah, I'm going to turn it over to you, I think, to open it up to conversation. Thank you, Dave. Great. So if somebody, again, if you have a question, um, please uh, raise your hand virtually. You should see a little blue um, hand sign that will go up next to your name so we know that you have a question and we will unmute you. Oh, a good um, question here from um, Ann Martin. Hi, Ann. Um, Dave, she's asking what one of the concerns that she has is what the impact will be on the movement for women athletes for pay equity. Uh, it's a fantastic question. I mean, th there, are, there are studies that show that fans of women's sports are actually more fiercely loyal at their core than, than fans of male sports, that there's more of a take it or leave it with men's sports. That, that's obviously not in terms of quantity, in terms of full size, but in terms of that loyal core, that exists, particularly for soccer and basketball. So I'm hopeful those, those movements can continue. I mean, we've seen the growth of women's sports unions in the WNBA. Uh, we've seen the incredible fierce fights in the U.S. women's uh, national soccer team uh, in their fight for equal pay and for pay equity and for also equity in terms of training and the quality of fields. Um, I'm hoping that those stay, stay strong on the basis of the loyalty that the fans have to the sports themselves. Um, will ownership use the coronavirus as a way to derail that kind of progress? Of course they will. I think that's something <laughs> we have to expect. But, but I think like seeing sports in the political sense and being able to offer solidarity to these athletes, whether we're fans or not, is going to be critical um, in, in the months and years ahead. There's Great. one from. Yeah, here's a question from Ann Raleigh. What happens to college and high school sports? <sighs> um, terrific question. I mean, I mean, I think um, high school sports are going to be reintegrated in society when school is reintegrated in society. I, I have two children, one 15 and one 11, and you know they're asking this the same question of when they're going to be actually be able to play games again. And, you know, I, I really think it's pr probably going to be one of the last, the last dominoes to fall uh, when it comes to um, get just re rematriculating our children um, in the world of sports. Uh, college, 
I think we're going to have to see some major changes. I mean, I'm talking like high end division one college sports because the NCAA really did, I think, cloak itself in shame with how long they waited to cancel March Madness. It revealed something about themselves because think about the compare and contrast with the NBA. The NBA shut down very early. And I think one of the reasons why they shut down so early in March is because these players, you know, they're not just players, they're huge multi-million dollar investments who the NBA saw that they were risking once players started to come down with the coronavirus. In the NCAA, they didn't really seem to care uh, because they don't have to pay the players. So their investment is more in the, in the broadcast infrastructure of March Madness. They get 89% of their operating income uh, through that tournament in March, and they were so loath to give it up, even though they were risking the health of, of, of the players and of fans and, and the like. I mean, it was really, really a shameful display to see them dither. And so, I mean, I'm hoping that that's used as the jumping off point for major structural changes in college sports. Well, Peter just asked a good question, which he could, um, he wants to know if the idea of professional teams playing games without fans is viable because it leaves revenue in, intact and how would that affect games? Ah, it is a fine question, Peter. <laughs> um, Peter Rothberg person. It's interesting because China was experimenting at first with building a biodome so their mm. basketball association could continue and they abandoned that idea as unfeasible. And so there's a part of me that feels like if the Chinese couldn't pull this off, I'm not sure how we can pull this off. I mean, the problem is there's the sheer number of support staff that it takes uh, to pull off a game uh, is something that I don't know how it makes it feasible to play in front of empty arenas. Now, and if they do, it's going to be fascinating to see what that does to the product themselves. I mean, remember LeBron James's gut reaction, and this is like, I believe in late February, when he heard that playing in front of empty arenas might be a possibility, he immediately was like, I I'm not doing that. I'm not going to show up for that. And he later backtracked on those comments. And I've talked to NBA players and a couple of NFL players about this. And for them, the thought of playing and not being in front of that crowd uh, for them is something that's unfeasible. And I wonder what the fan response would be, what that would be like to watch a game and have in the, in, in the specter of silence and what that, that would even look like the one window I have into even understanding it um, you know other than Tampa Bay Rays games where fans never show up ha ha uh, <laughs> when, when, uh, the, the, the Baltimore <laughs> Orioles uh, when there was urban upheaval after the police killing of Freddie Gray the Baltimore Orioles played a game without fans and it was it was eerie I mean, it felt like a political statement unto itself. I mean, it wasn't like a comfortable, fun experience. I mean, it felt almost, almost like you were at a wake of sorts, which of course people were in Baltimore at that time. And uh, given what's facing us in the United States, I wonder if that would even prove to be a distraction watching games in front of empty arenas, or if it would just serve to remind us of where we are and that would um, have people looking for other forms of escape. Um, I wanted to ask, oh, go ahead, I was going to ask, um, Dave, you, you cover the globe. You don't just cover the United States and sports is a global phenomenon. Of course. Uh, could you give us a couple examples about what's happening around the world? I mean, I'm thinking we've covered, one of the things we're trying to do with the nation is cover what's going on in Cuba with humanitarian aid around COVID, South Korea, Spain, Italy. I mean, where the, it's just ravaged, but these are countries where sports is just woven into the national fabric. Absolutely, and, and it's on shutdown, um, well, which is forcing people to, to reckon with what, what li I mean, life without soccer in some countries is, is proving to be um, unimaginable. Uh, life without rugby in Australia, life without uh, the events that have binded communities together for years. I mean, imagine life without soccer in Brazil. Uh, it's just what people are reckoning with and trying to understand in their lives. I mean, we've seen some heroic examples of players in different leagues. I'm going to be writing about for the nation, uh, the greatest soccer player in the world, Lionel Messi, is donating 70% of his salary to the employees at Barcelona 
um, and other players on the team are doing the same. And I, I think like th this is what we're going to have to have to see. And I think global athletes need to come together and speak about global tournaments and mm -hmm. they need to make sure that they can only participate in these tournaments if, uh, if it's safe. Uh, one of the things um, I wrote about for the nation, which was, I think, uh, an undercovered story, was with the delaying of the Tokyo Olympics to 2021. Uh, that doesn't happen without different federations and athletes all over the world, from table tennis players um, in China to the Canadian Olympic Committee to swimmers in the United States, all communicating over social media and deciding collectively that international sports actually have an extra level of danger uh, when you're talking about a global pandemic. And, and it's interesting because to see athletes face this problem globally and to see the United States under this presidency face it in the most narrow and nationalistic of terms. And so we're not really seeing a global response to the pandemic except in, this, in the world of sports. It's quite the contrast. That's fascinating. Um, Dave, Vicki Baucom asks if you might have any thoughts about what the financial impact on cities who financed these arenas that are now silent might be. Yeah, I mean, we, we don't have uh, the, I, I've been trying to look into that. We don't have the data um, in on that yet, but um, I mean, we can, we, can, uh, we can expect in a lot of cases like the defaulting um, on these arenas and then they'll become, uh, the, the term in uh, international sports uh, is the, is white elephant, and that's the slang for a stadium that gets built and then has no use value after the Olympics or after the World Cup, and then they have to find use values for them. Like in Brazil, um, I, I went to what was formerly a World Cup stadium that had been turned into an open air prison, for example, and another stadium that uh, people were renting out for for quinceañeras and 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 parties of that nature. Uh, because there was no, there were no games to support it. I think that that that's a, a fear that there's not going to be enough money to generate paying back the bonds that were put forward to 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 actually fund these stadiums in the first place. Um, in which case, I think cities are going to find themselves in an even greater crisis. And but the solution though is they're going to have to tax the billionaires who fleece these cities to actually pay off the debts themselves out of pocket. And, and I think in different cities, you're gonna see some serious pitched battles uh, to get them to, to put their money where their mouth is. And the billionaires are gonna say, well, wait a minute, we don't have as many fans. We don't have, have as lucrative a TV contract. We can't pay back uh, the bonds. And uh, there's gonna be a political fight between public and private. And frankly, this fight has been a long time coming. Like the idea of turning public wealth into private ownership has been a feature of, of neoliberal sports. Uh, for, for, for several generations since the 1970s. And um, I, I've called it a, a, a neoliberal glo um, Trojan horse or a, a sporting shock doctrine to use the language of Naomi Klein. And I think what we're going to see is an actual, an actual battle between the public and the private as far as who actually owns the debt on these stadiums. So Dave, Ann Martin is wondering what might be motivating the, the players to, to be as generous as they are. Could it, could it be their roots? Um, is it gonna create a greater bond between player and fans? And, and what, what do you think keeps the more wealthy uh, people in sports from following their lead? It's a great question. Um, I mean, based on the interviews I've read and some of the conversations I've had, it absolutely has to do with the, um, the humble beginnings of many athletes. I mean, it's, 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 it's very interesting because um, in the base of NBA players uh, tends to be uh, African-American and come from a lower economic strata. And so th there is a solidarity that exists between low wage workers and NBA players, which is I think why you've seen it the most in the NBA. Um, in Major League Baseball, uh, there are very few black American players at this point. Like right now, it's, uh, it's players largely from the Dominican Republic and Venezuela and Cuba. And those players are sending money back to their communities, as you can understand. And, and, um, and white players uh, in Major League Baseball, they tend to be extremely conservative politically. So you're seeing less of that. 
Um, and in the NFL, some players have, have, have ponied up and given money to local communities as well and are trying to make that happen. Um, I just think that the billionaires, they're saying, well, we're already giving up tons of money because the games aren't playing as if they're making this kind of sacrifice. That's some of the language that you hear. It's like, how can you say we're not giving up money? We're giving up tons of money because we've chosen to shut the doors to, to, to the games themselves. And that, that answer is just not nearly good enough because like I said before, and this is so important, promises were made when money went into these stadiums. And those promises need to be kept in terms of providing some form of stable service economy infrastructure uh, for the workers and for the communities from which they come. Uh, Robert Gorchoff is asking how you think the presidential election might affect the um, long-term financial uh, structure of professional sports. Well, th there's one thing about that that's very interesting is the word is that Donald Trump is agitating fiercely among the ownership of the National Football League uh, to play the games this fall, no matter mm -hmm. what the scenario is. And um, if, if you've read our coverage about the, the unholy nexus between NFL ownership and Donald Trump, uh, we're not the only ones who've written about it. We're talking million dollar donors across the ownership boxes in the National Football League. And uh, there have even been surreptitiously taped recordings that the New York Times broke about uh, the fear that NFL owners have of Donald Trump and the contempt they have for him, even though they still write him the big checks. And so it's going to be very interesting to see how that, that factor of it plays out. Like, is the NFL going to succumb to political pressure or are they going to go by the timeline of the virus itself? Uh, and I, I think that question will largely be answered over the course of the summer. Um, and we're going to see, you know, I mean, I mean, it's just March was such a long month that sort of projecting not just what the medical situation is going to be like in September, but our psychological situation is, is going to be like in September. It's just impossible to predict at this point. I mean, I can't believe it. I'm so grateful it's April 1st. I can't even tell you, although I'm <laughs> nervous what April will bring. Um, but I keep thinking of this line from Oscar Wilde, who was asked about prison. And he said, every day felt like a year, but it was a year in which the days were long. Uh, that's how I feel about, about March. So, I mean, so it's just so impossible to telescope what things are going to be like in September, but we already know that there is some, some political shenanigans going on between Trump and the National Football League. I think that everybody's probably feeling that the days were very long in March, and I, I, I wonder if people who might be feeling that really acutely are the younger among us, which brings me to Joan Roach's question. She's asking how this might impact college recruiting for next year. And I want to expand that because there are kids who are hoping to go to college on scholarship, mm -hmm. on sports scholarship. There are maybe seniors are set, but you know, juniors have been jockeying for those spots as well. So I wonder how the that whole chain is affected. Yeah, uh, I think the chain is going to be going to be ruptured going in going into this fall. Um, everything we're going to see if it's worth the paper it's printed on. Um, in terms of these recruitment letters. I mean, we're going to see how economically damaged the schools are by this, how damaged the NCAA has been through the process of not being able to have March Madness. And it's basically its annual operating income. I mean, they have insurance, but it's not going to be nearly what they would have produced. So it, it's going to be very, very interesting to see how, how that pipeline gets affected going forward. I mean, the letters have gone out. Uh, will the letters be honored? I mean, is, is really is the open question. Um, Anne's asking about um, uh, arenas being used for field hospitals, uh, satellite hospitals. I, I don't know if you know anything about that, but that's also an interesting question. If owners would just donate that space, or if they're going to be looking for some um, compensation from the community. I think it would be very smart from a public relations perspective for, for sports owners to do that. Uh, but yeah, no, you're right. We need the space. And one of the things we saw uh, during the, the horrific uh, hurricane and the breaking of the levees in New Orleans back in 2005 
uh, was that so much of the public infrastructure to house people did not exist in New Orleans, but the only thing that did exist that had gotten the, the kind of upkeep necessary uh, was the Louisiana Superdome, and it quickly became uninhabitable within hours. Uh, can a and then, but then we saw in Houston, they were able to make at least a refugee center um, for people um, where the Houston Astros played uh, for folks who were coming from New Orleans. So I think it would be a very wise use of, of, of space in the context of cities where we don't have public space. I mean, I, I read about the, the hospital they're trying to build in Central Park. Uh, not, not every city has a Central Park, even has that kind of green space where one can be set up. I mean, because so much of public space has been put over towards sports. So I certainly do hope that's the case. And that's a great point. And that, that should be something that we, that we agitate for um, as the space becomes needed. Uh, Claudia um, is asking a lighthearted question and thank you for that because I think we all need those in this moment. Um, she wonders if you have any sport movie recommendations because we all need uh, we all need some good entertainment while we're at home. A uh, great question. I mean, honestly, it depends on genre. I mean, for those of you out there who like <laughs> a little so crazy, who yeah. like a little romance in your sports, uh, Bull Durham or Personal oh. Best come to mind. Love and Basketball is an underrated all-time movie. I love Love and Basketball. For people who like history and some politics, uh, John Sayles' movie Eight Men Out. Uh, is an absolute wonder. I love Eight Men Out about the 1919 Chicago White Sox. Uh, for those of you who like your heartstrings pulled a little bit, there's of course Hoosiers about basketball, Field of Dreams about baseball. Uh, oh, so many good ones. For those for those of you who've got kids, look check out a basketball movie called Above the Rim. Younger kids, there's Space Jam and Like Mike is a terrific one. Um, my son has watched Like Mike so many times or so many times I can't even tell you um and it, it, so th that that's the I'm trying to think there there's so many more sports movies I mean obviously if, if there is ever a time to revisit the Rocky movies now's the time uh, <laughs> I mean I when I was uh 17 I actually won a radio contest when Rocky 5 came out in New York by sitting in the theater and watching all five in a row uh without bathroom breaks that really made my mother proud. Um, uh. Sat in the theater from 4 p.m. to 2 a.m. and uh, won won that radio contest. And uh, so, so if you know, put, putting yourselves through those kinds of rituals, I don't necessarily recommend from a health perspective. But I think sports movies are are just terrific right now um, as a way to sort of connect with the energy of sports and you know, have, have a collective experience with your family. Because so many of these sports movies are not even necessarily about sports. So you can find the genre that fits your family uh, through them. We have a bunch of suggestions. I'll just make sure everybody sees them. Angels in the Outfield, the Jack and, Jackie Robinson story, The Sandlot. Um, Peter, I've never heard of this. The Fish That, fish that Saved Pittsburgh. Great one. Basketball <laughs> in the 70s. Very, very <laughs> Funky fresh. Um, Anna is asking uh, if you think there might be any positive structural change for sports coming out of this moment. Well, it's so interesting because sports is reflective of our society. And I think we're asking that same question, excuse me, I think we're asking that same question about our world because there's clearly um, a social democratic response to the coronavirus, which we, I think, uh, favor and desperately need. And there's also a very hyper ethno-nationalist response, uh, which we could see as well. Similarly in sports, um, I think we're going to see the people who are the minders of sports, those the owners, the commissioners, um, attempt to make up their financial losses on our backs and have it be business as usual, just far, far, far more exploitative, which I think is very similar to a lot of the Trump bailout plans. But I think we can fight for a different kind of sports in this context. Um, one thing is that uh, during the Great Depression, through the Works Progress Administration, uh, Franklin Roosevelt put people to work creating uh, more community fields and gymnasiums uh, so people could go out and get exercise and people weren't necessarily 
couldn't necessarily afford to go to sporting events. So in the 30s, you actually had more people um, engage with sports through play as opposed to engaging with sports uh, through just watching. And, you know, as people need jobs as we come out of this, I mean, that would be an incredible response and a structural change in sports. As we attempt to get more people moving and exercising and less watching, I'd certainly love to see that. Um, and I also would very much like to see in sports like a greater emphasis on equity and access. Uh, if, if these leagues want younger fans to come and watch and be a part of it, they have to make ticket prices more affordable. They have to. Uh, if people want sports to have the kind of place in society that they want, they have to stop these sweetheart cable deals where you have a situation like in Los Angeles where only half the city can watch Dodgers games because they don't have the right cable package. Uh, the, these are the sort of things I think we can look at to make demands of the sports world to fight for more equity and to fight for, I mean, really a social democratic response to the sports world. And then lastly, I think we need to rethink global sports events like I've written for the nation, like the Olympics and the World Cup. Uh, so they're, they're less rooted in debt, displacement and hyper militarization. I'd very much like to see that. Um, I wanted to get to a question that John had earlier um, said, he sees an impressive maturity in some of the sports writing right now in the LA and New York Times in the face of this crisis. I wanted to know if there's a plan for outreach into the sports writing community to take political advantage of this moment. This is so difficult. It's a great question. What's so difficult is so many of the best sports writers are right now being laid off because of what's taking place. Uh, Chris Ballard at Sports Illustrated, who to me is one of the great basketball writers this country has ever produced was laid off earlier this week and sent uh, shockwaves. Uh, Sarah Quack, who was an editor at Sports Illustrated, also laid off. And this comes months after Sports Illustrated laid off 50% of its staff. So I think a lot of folks are, are really concerned about just holding on to their jobs. Um, Katrina mentioned earlier about the future of newspapers. I mean, the sports section, which Bob Lipsight uh, memorably uh, teamed the, the toy department uh, of the media. I mean, one wonders if the toy department is going to be the first to go. I certainly hope not, because I think sports is such a vital reflection, and it's a way to reach people who otherwise would not be reached by these politics, people who only read sports or care about sports, but don't care about the broader issues of the day. Um, so I think we're seeing some amazing sports writing right now, uh, but I'm concerned about the future of the of the profession and what it's going to look like once the dust is cleared. And we're we're just a, about out of time, so we have time for one more question. If anybody's typing it in, type fast. And um, while we wait to see if that happens, um, Ann Martin is wondering about um, if it's a good idea to be running past games on television right now. What's if there's value to that? Yeah, I mean, first and foremost, uh, let me say folks should check out the chat section because there's some amazing movie suggestions that I wasn't grabbing off the top of my head. I mean, someone put down Breaking Away, which I get a lump in my throat just seeing the, the phrase Breaking Away. So uh, check that out if you get the chance. Um, I, I think there is a value to watching the old games. I mean, I mean I'm, some, I'm talking from the perspective of, of being a sports fan. I mean, there, there's there's a rewatchability to sports that we often don't take advantage of because it's always on to the next game. It's always forward looking. It's very rarely historical. And I mean, I, I'm really excited to, and I've done this a couple of times with my son already. I'm really excited when we go to, to one of the networks and we can rewatch something and I can help him understand it in, in a deeper kind of a way. So at, for, as a sports fan, I really like the engagement in the past. Um, and as somebody who loves sports history, I like the engagement in the past. And look for the big sports event of this entire month, if not the entire spring, is going to be ESPN releasing this multi-part, like I think it's 10-part documentary about Michael Jordan and the Bulls. And there's more buzz around this than anything we've seen in the sports documentary world. Uh, even more buzz around, around this than was around the OJ documentary uh, that ESPN put out that won an Oscar. So... Um, expect to hear a lot about that and expect that to be people's release from feeling the sort of pent up where are my sports itchiness that you see all over social media. Dave, if it's time to close, I just want to, I mean, it, you gave us an extraordinary, you were an extraordinary guide to these times and you brought us hope amidst crisis. 
how many sports writers lead with a social democratic response to the sports world? Um, we are going to do a special issue, we hope, at the end of May called, you know, Time to Think Big. And I think the question Anna Hyatt posed to you about how we come out of this with a different kind of sports world is something that should be one of imagination, even in these times. But oh. above all, I come back to what you said at the end, I mean, about the sports writers. I think sports writing also found in the Me Too mo moment a real political outlet. But it is devastating every day. I don't know if people follow this to watch regional newspapers be gutted um, and going down. It's blood on the floor, which is why we reached out the other day to do a big piece on stimulus for journalism. In these times, more than ever, we need quality journalism. And um, Dave is so much a part of that and what he does, covering the underreported, covering it with humanity, and uh, also bringing joy which is part of sports, but never forgetting there's an underside to sports, which we have to cover. Truth telling is part of our work. And also, as I said earlier, making sure we cover the workers on the front lines. Um, and one thing we haven't talked about, and we talked about the presidential race, but how do we protect our elections and have elections in these times? Um, and one thing Dave does, which we hope to do at The Nation all the time is bring history to bear. But these are uncertain times, to say the least, unprecedented in so many difficult ways that we always try to find, as Dave spoke of, the alternative to shock therapy is hope therapy, hope doctrine, laying out what we believe, the bold solutions. But I want to thank all of you who had such great questions today for being part of our community. And in these uncertain times, we know that we have a community to work, uh, to talk to. And I hope you'll join us next Wednesday. I hope you'll support us because as I opened with, these are times which demand, need an independent free press, a quality press uh, to cover the untruths and lay out the truths. And um, thank you so much for being with us. And may we move forward with courage, compassion, solidarity, and something I have used as a closing ever since November, 2016 onward.